the Buffalo History Channel was a um, platform that I created as a means to network better in my new city of residence, which is uh, the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. I moved here from uh, Buffalo, New York after living in Buffalo throughout my adult life for the last uh, 25 years. Decided I needed to change the scenery, moved down here to the DMV, and um, as I was starting to get out here to um, network with uh, many, some of the peers that I was meeting, and I would direct them to my YouTube channel, which was at the time Urban Legacy Filmworks, and to have them look at my historical documentary work that I'm best known for in Buffalo, I would come to discover that it's kind of hard to do because to try to direct them to a certain piece of work, yeah, I could send you a link, but, you know, people will look through my channel and have to, my channel was very cluttered with not just documentary work, but all kinds of various work through commercials and um, some of the radio shows and podcasts that I used to do back in the day. And I always wanted to uh, create a separate channel to just be a single place for all of my historical work. Because once I came out here, I was intending to put my focus more so towards historical and documentary filmmaking. And um, I was going to, once I moved down here, I took all my my video materials from Buffalo, New York, moved it down here, and I just started to um, throw everything and upload, it every, upload everything onto the YouTube channel. I called it Buffalo History Channel because it was Buffalo history. There was no real <laughs> solid thought process behind it. That's just simply what I called it. It was a means to help me network with people better out here in my new play, new city of residence. Now, as I was uploading material onto the YouTube channel, I would share it on my Facebook page. And over the course of um, the next two to three months, what I came to discover was that I was getting a lot of traffic on that YouTube platform. And it started to slowly become more so than what I was starting to get, but than what I was getting on my Urban Legacy channel, which was pretty stagnated. And, uh, huh, I didn't think much of it. I mean, I uploaded, you know, the, the old Build series. I uploaded uh, Model Cities and the Buffalonians and all of any piece of documentary work that I ever did in Buffalo was upload, has been uploaded onto the Buffalo History Channel. And um, I also brought back with me a lot, of, a lot of various footage that I had just shot for years and years throughout the 90s and 2000s of various things going on in the Buffalo community. And uh, some of that stuff, I, in certain, some of the interviews that I compiled over the years, I would upload that to the channel as well. And still, I was starting to get a lot of traction. And um, getting comments and getting subscriptions. And I wasn't really looking for that. But, I mean, I would put it on, when I would share it on Facebook, I would put it there. But it was really strange at first. You know, all the traffic that I was getting to the channel. I was like, okay, this is interesting. And uh, one of the things that really made it turn a corner, Brenda Brown had uh, connected me with uh, Kevin Blackford, who was the founder of the Buffalo chapter of the Black Panther Party. And uh, I had had the newsreel of his press conference outside the Panther headquarters for over 20 years when I found that along with all of the build footage and everything else up at Canisius College. And um, 
it, I thought that was, I was just like, wow. I mean, I, I had a chance to talk to him over the phone. And we planned to get together when I, had, when I would come back to Buffalo to visit for the Juneteenth Festival. He was going to come up to Buffalo because he comes back frequently to visit his mother. And we were going to get together and do a nice sit-down, full-length, in-depth interview about his time in Buffalo with the Black Panthers. Well, as the world knows and history will indicate, um, in early 2020, we had a um, phenomenon called COVID-19, the pandemic, and um, <laughs> which basically shut down the entire world. So events were shut down, businesses were shut down, life as we knew it had changed. And um, the same applied with urban, the printing production for Urban Legacy. So, um, and I, I noticed that a lot of what was going on on the internet was people would be video conferencing through platforms like Zoom and platforms like StreamYard. And at the time, I hadn't quite really orientated myself to that or warmed to it because as an old school producer, you know, you, you're, I'm more used to setting up the camera, setting up the lights, setting up the microphone and doing a proper interview. So um, I didn't quite do it that way. I told Kevin that we'll just do, I'll just do like a um, phone interview. And I just have, I just had him on speakerphone and I had my cell phone camera and I used a picture of him. I used a, a picture in picture thing on the video and B-rolled some Black Pan old Black Panther footage with the interview when I produced it. And uh, I put that on and that just, that whole thing just blew up. And it, at that point it dawned on me that, wow, I might actually have something here. And I already called it the Buffalo History Channel, so there might be an opportunity to, uh, I mean, I'm not in Buffalo and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not living in Buffalo anymore. I'm living in a new city, so why am I going to be uh, doing something that, but here I am still catering to Buffalo and I'm living in a whole new city, but the whole thing kept growing so fast that it was like, I, I can't just ignore it, you know, you got to build on it. I would say that one of my favorite things to do with the Buffalo History Channel has been the opportunity to do various interviews. And um, as I started to see how the channel was growing, I decided to actually run it like a true platform. You know, I mean, I've been on YouTube for a number of years since, discovered YouTube since uh, 2006. So I've been on it for a pretty long time, and I've just always just been a YouTube watcher. I've uploaded various videos, never really thought much of it when I uploaded them. I did become a YouTube partner and was able to make a little bit of, got a little bit of monetization and was able to make some money around the, the early 2000 teens. So I was somewhat successful on YouTube for a period of time before they made a lot of changes and um, things got more predicated on analytics and watch time hours and things of that nature. So I had to uh, do a little bit of study in, on that, and I'm still re I'm still learning a lot of things about how to move on YouTube at this point because I never really because I guess the, the title now is con is content creator, and I never really thought of myself as being a content creator, but I guess I officially am now because the channel is starting to do very very well for itself, and. As I said, one of my favorite things to do is interviews. And I like to try to build the, the channel on just trying to highlight the rarest of stories and the rarest of interviews. People who would not, who we really would not see highlighted. You know, and a lot of, of course, most people will notice that the Buffalo History Channel focuses a lot on the history of Black Buffalo. Well, the reason for that is, throughout the years, that's pretty much been the bulk of my work, <laughs> Buffalo Black History. That does not, however, mean that 
I'm not interested in dealing with the history of other communities in the city of Buffalo, and I do intend to tackle some stories. I mean, I'm interested in stories in the story of Love Canal, for instance. I'm interested in the story of um, the propane explosion of 1983. Just example, just for example. So those those stories will be coming in the not too distant future, but the main focus has been on the history of Black Buffalo because Black Buffalo is not is something that really isn't highlighted all that much. And um, some of the interviews I've been able to do have been some of the rarest stories. Of like, for example, um, I had an opportunity to interview one of my first mentors in media, Jimmy Lyons, whose father, incidentally, Jimmy Lyons Sr was the very first African-American radio disc jockey in the city of Buffalo, full-time. So we finally had an opportunity to get his story told and had his son on, and his son mentored me, and he talk, talked about his father. He talked about his career as well. We reminisced on the Buffalo Beat Show, which I job-shadowed on back in the late 1980s when I was just a 16-year-old kid just hanging around and looking at the industry, considering going to college for this and eventually pursuing it as a career. And uh, the interviews have been very, very, have probably been the most popular on the channel. And, you know, trying to find different way. I mean, I've, I've worked in television, so I try to create pro, little creative promos and my wheels are always turning, so this is kind of a new thing for me, and I'm building on to this as slowly but surely as put things on as they as the ideas come to me. So I'm very happy that um, and you know the challenge. I have to sh thank the challenger for the wonderful article that was written on the Buffalo History Channel. Thanks to uh, Leah as well as Al Nisa for all of their support. That is a pretty extensive history. I will get you through it. I'll try to walk you through this as uh, best I can. Um, I guess the road to the Buffalo History Channel pretty much begins in uh, 1997 upon completing the uh, Build documentary film series. Um, in October of 1997, we had the premiere at Hall Walls, and um, I was talking with um, Dr. Monroe Fordham and John Smith, and they had impressed upon me that what I had done with the Bill documentary was a rather unique thing. Well, I think this is a monumental achievement because what it does, it captures the history of a very important organization by videotaping and interviewing the people that were involved in it, which is a rare thing to, to happen. And, and I think this is, Doug should be commended and the people that work with him should be commended. This is really a monumental achievement and it's a great thing for the community of Buffalo. And it was just a joy watching some of the people because in a, in a sense this was a reunion of some of the people that were active in the 60s and it was a joy to, for me to watch some of them uh, because I hadn't seen many of them in years and it was a good thing for generations to touch base with each other and to share the information and to share their goals and ideas on what they want for their community. Because you know the whole idea of videotaping and interviewing people and giving oral histories about conditions and times in the Buffalo Black community through the 1960s and 70s up to that point was a very rare thing because it really hadn't happened. You know, historical preservation and the documenting of history, that was something that was kind of new, but it was beginning to take shape and what really had spearheaded those efforts was the work of a gentleman by the name of Kevin Cottrell, who had spearheaded the effort to 
launch historic the historic preservation of the of Michi of Michigan of Michigan Street. Uh, Michigan Street was home to a number of landmarks: the Michigan Street Baptist Church and the Colored Musicians Club, as well as the Jesse Nash House. And um, he was he had just launched an effort to they put that on the National Historic Register and and set and set up the area that area in Western New York for heritage tourism, which now goes on today throughout the city of Buffalo and Niagara Falls and throughout the region of the Western New York region. And most of the documenting of history mainly focused at that time on, frankly, the Underground Railroad because Buffalo was an under, a, a stop on the Underground Railroad. And um, that, um, that was the main thing that was going on. So what I was bringing into the equation, little did I know, was something brand new because nobody was really focusing on the history of other areas of the Buffalo community. I dealt, I started dealing with the civil rights and black power movements. Now for me, that was just some, this was just, Bill was just one project that I had done at the time. So I did have my sights set. I was still a young guy, around 25 years old. I did have my sights set on doing other things like, like getting into commercial production and things of that nature. But I decided that, you know, I would take this on and I took a job at the uh, Cable Access Center and uh, I, I created a community show called BCTV Tonight where I was going to make it into a community news magazine show and there would be segments that would deal with Buffalo history. One of my, the segments that I was developing was uh, I wanted to ultimately do a segment highlighting Buffalo, local Buffalo black media figures throughout the television and radio business. And I was going to start that with uh, highlighting the people at the public access, the producers of public access, particularly during the original Sunship Communications era. And I called that segment public access, Buffalo's public access pioneers. Um, I wasn't able to really see a lot of that, that effort through. Uh, job ended under some... Uh, unfortunate circumstances I won't go into that that's a whole nother that's a whole nother interview um, but once what was very interesting about that was um, I departed public access then transitioned into radio from 1999 to 2000 and I wouldn't be back in television for for several years till like 2009 but throughout the early 2000s one of the things, the interesting things that I noticed was that documenting history was slowly becoming a thing in the city of Buffalo. You had something get implemented in the city of Buffalo called the Story. You had the Story Corps that came to Buffalo, and they would set up shop downtown, and uh, people would stop by these tents, and they would tell their oral histories of various aspects of the of, of Buffalo of Buffalo New York they just give give their, their their own oral histories and tell these different Buffalo stories about their family about organizations they were with just all kinds of civil rights all kinds of stories this happened right after right on the heels of me leaving uh, public access and you had a few other efforts too they they did this, they started an effort also called digital storytelling which was a uh, starting to get done by a lot of the other media arts organizations. So things were starting to grow with that. In uh, 2001, I had an idea just to draft up this proposal one day uh, for a, a Black History Museum. And, you know, being sometimes, you know, you just sometimes you, when you're just young and ambitious and you just have these these bright ideas, you know, I called it the uh, Western New York Institute for African-American History. And one of the unique things about it was that it was going to have a uh, multimedia component. 
and it was going to teach young people how to produce their own documentaries, their own documentary films. And um, that concept, I had wrote up a proposal for it, pretty, pretty extensive proposal, pretty concise, pretty solid, but I never really implemented it, but it was implemented in other ways. Uh, 2002, I started a media literacy program called the Buffalo Community Media Project, and I had some young people that summer, and uh, they put together a uh, little documentary where they went around the city of Buffalo and interviewed various people in the community by ask, having them answer one question. What does community mean to you? The title of the documentary was called In Search of Community. Uh, then in 2003, one year later, I took all the films that I got from Canisius College that were in the Build documentary and in the Model Cities documentary. And, you know, if you, you can hear the story, the stories about that can be seen on the Buffalo History Channel. I don't, I'm not going to go into those stories. Those, that's, those are too, too much to go into, but you can look at the videos and get the information that you need from there. But I took a lot of those films and I freeze framed, I took still, still, still images of those films and made them into still pictures. And I took the pictures and I would put it on uh, some, those trifold uh, science boards. And I made it into a traveling museum called Community Images. <laughs> Pictures are worth a thousand words. Doug Ruffin has a lot to say. I see close to a million words in just this exhibit alone. The Langston Hughes Institute on High Street is built on a foundation of history. In these rooms, Langston Hughes led dance classes. Teachers led art classes. And now Doug Ruffin is leading a new generation back in time. You have a beautiful, beautiful history in Buffalo. You have. You, there was a time in Buffalo's African-American community where you had businesses. You had people, your people who were our parents and our grandparents and our next door neighbors who stood up and fought for civil rights and for black power and empowerment in the community and cultural awareness and, and education. He says history books just can't capture African-American history in Buffalo the way film can. A walk through this room is a walk through time. There was a civil rights movement in here in the Buffalo area. There was a black power movement here in the city of Buffalo. It was all, Buffalo was also a hot spot of the, one of the main hot spots of the world. Doug Ruffin hopes these pictures, these films, stay with everyone in Buffalo long after they leave this building. That, that purpose is right there, to learn about your past. You never know where you're going until you know where you've been. And that made its appearance, traveled all around the city of Buffalo, made its appearance at various events, various schools and the libraries. And it was very, very successful for several years. Also, during the uh, course of the 2000s, mostly through the early 2000s, um, I went and um, purchased some new camera equipment and uh, I decided that I would start to just go to various community events and just record, shoot, film, you know, and I wanted to record all these events for posterity. I mean, these events at the time, I figured one of the things that I discovered when I was putting together Build and I was producing Model Cities is that, you know, I would do my research on a lot of things and I would discover that not for every piece of footage that I did have on something, there was also other pieces of footage that I never had that I wish that I had. I mean, you know, Buffalo, even through the media, this is... Not everything got coverage, and I can't say that we've done a completely good job of keeping history. And there's through no fault, to, no, really not too much of anybody's fault, because usually when you're doing things at the moment, you're not always thinking about chalking up history. It's not something that's always paramount in your mind. I mean, it's just something that you're doing for that moment. 
So I kind of, in my way of forward thinking, you know, I figure I would find significant events, bring my camera to it, film it, keep the footage, and just hold on to it for posterity. And a lot of that footage and, I, and even interviews that I've shot with people, because that was another one of my uh, intents when I got to public access, was I was going to go around the community and interview various pillars of the community and have them just tell their life stories on camera. Was able to do that with a few people. I was not able to do it with as many people as I intended to do that with. And regrettably, many of those people have since passed on and I am eternally regretful and I'm still kicking myself about a lot of that stuff to this day about some of the interviews that I did not get. In uh, 2007, two unique things happened. Um, I had a chance to return to radio by working for a radio station 1080 AM WUFO. And uh, as I was coming into WUFO, I was leaving the AmeriCorps program. But um, I was called upon by the AmeriCorps program in January of 2007 to participate in a program called the Bus Seat for Social Justice. Basically what that was where they took a lot of old bus seats off of the yellow buses, the yellow cheese, you know, the yellow cheese buses, and they had all these old bus seats and they would get artists from the community together to just do creative arts on these bus seats. And um, they would house the seats in various institutions throughout the city of Buffalo. And the seat that I was working on, it just so happened that the seat that I was working on, I already said that, said that it was going to be a tribute to the BUILD organization because 2007 was to be the 10th anniversary of the BUILD documentary series. And um, then they told me that my seat was going to be put up in the Buffalo History Museum. And I, my eyes just lit up. So I knew I had to do a bang-up job on the bus seat. It, now, I have to be honest, it wasn't that extravagant. You know, all I did was I took a lot of pictures and um, plastered them on the seat. <laughs> That's basically what I did. And uh, got some art, some, some art supplies that some, some artists familiarized me with. Uh, it was called Mod Podge or something. And we were able to glaze over the seats and put the the pictures on it, that way they don't peel off and they're just on there forever, you know. And uh, they put some people with the, from community people with me and two or three ladies that we, we just worked together on the seats. I showed them the pictures and we put the pictures in different, different spots on the bus seat. And you can go up to the Buffalo History Museum on its second floor and it's right there sitting in the, sil in the civil rights section to this very day. And I am very grateful to the Buffalo History Museum for continuing to house that bus seat for social justice in tribute to the BUILD organization. Like I said earlier, I took a job at a radio station WUFO and um, 2007 happened to be their 45th anniversary. Came there at a pretty unique time. They were planning to have a big event in the summertime commemorating 45 years. They were going to put together a book a uh, WFO Hall of Fame to recognize some of their passed on DJs. And um, I remember saying to them that um, when I was produced doing pre-production and research for the build series, I would go on to go into the microfilm section and look through, when I would look through the microfilms of the Chip Buffalo Challenger and Buffalo Criterion, I would notice when I was looking for articles that I would see all these advertisements pertaining to the radio stations. So I had to, I went back there, pulled some of the microfilms, found those advertisements, printed them up, had all the old DJs from, from the past on there. And um, I put the, I already had the community images exhibit. I put together a special display board commemorating WUFO's history. 
and um, also I put together a uh, television show highlighting its history, put together a small mini documentary series, mini documentary called The Voices of WFO. And over the years, people would send me different pictures. Uh, Don Mullins' family sent, sent some pictures that we posted on Facebook in, the, in a Facebook WFO history group at one time. And uh, they, I would get various audio from, from different people, from different jocks and their families. So we were able to really pull a lot of that stuff together. And one of the best things to happen during that time was it was a really, really good time because Waffle was also um, moving from its longtime location at um, 89 LaSalle to 143 Broadway, where it is today. They had a going away party, a farewell to 89 LaSalle Avenue party that I documented. I documented the first time we entered into 143 Broadway. They would eventually move from AM to FM, and now they're Power 96.5. So that was a really, really, and, and today, and as a result of all that, all that stuff that I did, that all the documenting the history that I did for them, now they were able to construct their own WUFO museum. So it was a really beautiful experience that I was happy and proud to have had a hand in. One of the things that I always wanted to do throughout my years of working in media was get into photography. I always had a fascination for it. And I decided in 2013 to kind of continue to kind of continue what I was doing in the early 2000s with video to start doing it transition from video to just still photography. And I would go around to do the community, mainly at Juneteenth was one of my favorite places to go and the Jefferson Avenue Arts Festival. But I went around to different community events and just took pictures throughout the community. Uh, one of the influences for that was uh, Baba Simba Embley. He was always there with his camera, pe peace and love, and it was kind of in tribute to him as well. And I would just go around there, just take a lot of photos, again, for posterity, you know, again, when I'm documenting stuff, you know, sometimes it can be really, really hard to find the materials you need to find for certain topics. So what I decided to do, if I ever decided to do anything down the line, I want to make sure I have it. I wanted to create my own archival library of the Buffalo community. And over the years, I was able to do that. Man, how crazy was that? 2019, I released uh, 67 Buffalo Uprising. Uh, first documentary ever to really fully highlight the uh, story behind the uh, 1967 Buffalo East Side riot. And uh, what a surprise to, to see that one year later, over 50 years down the line, in the summer of 2020, you have another uprising, an even bigger one. <laughs> The only thing about it is that I will I will have to admit that as a film the filmmaker side of me absolutely hates that I was not on hand to film that because I had intended to be there at the time but I was I was told not to come back because you know the go, go, the governor put a travel ban you know so and I I was not able to come back and lo and behold another Buffalo uprising takes place. So I had to sit at my home here in Maryland and watch all the activity from that uprising. Wow. Wow. I would say that, honestly, that the advent of uh, social media has bought not just Buffalo media in general, full circle, but Buffalo, but, but the documentation of Buffalo's and preservation of Buffalo's community history, black, not but well, I, I would say black community and wider community history. It's bought it all full. Social media has bought it all full circle.
you go on Facebook now, you have uh, Facebook groups that highlight Buffalo's history, several groups. Um, you have uh, Michelle Ragland's group, you have Bartell Miller's group, um, you have uh, Steve Seashon's work with the staff announcer on on the YouTube channel and the books that, he, that he's written. Buffalo history, documenting of Buffalo's history has really, really, um, it's come full circle. It's really, really become a thing over the years. It's come a long way from from my from my vantage point. It's come a long way from uh, the '90s in the conversation that uh, Dr. Fordham and uh, John Smith had with me, and um, the pioneering work of uh, Kevin Cottrell with, with Michigan Street. We've really come a long way because, you know, we people are, it's, it really caused a lot of people to take, when you're documenting history, you're also taking more pride in your city. And even though I'm not there anymore, because I had to move on to a better life, there's still aspects of, but doesn't mean that you, that you don't, that you love it any less. And um, it's definitely something that gives me joy. I've always been a history buff, a history lover. And uh, I'm just trying, I try to do what I can to make my contribution through the skills that I have to offer. And the Buffalo History Channel is, it's kind of, it, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. It wasn't something that I had, I never intended it to be what, it, what it's become. It just manifested itself and into something and just took on a life of its own and I cannot be any more grateful I mean this has become like a, an obsession now for me man it's like I I mean people are really my subscribers are keeping me on the feedback that I get for any time I make a post on something it really really keeps me on point keeps me on target I'm like whoo the sky's the limit with this thing, and I'm gonna. I'm definitely. I have a lot of ideas that I don't want to go into right now, but I definitely intend to take the Buffalo History Channel as far as I can take it. So there's many. There will be many more documentaries. There will be original productions, and definitely many more interviews. Um, I'm getting people sending, giving me suggestions for interviews, and. Um, Sky's the limit, and uh, all I'll say is uh, stay tuned because there's more to come from the Buffalo History Channel. But the story that I've laid out, the story that I've laid out for you is to give you a sense of what the road, the road to the history, to, to the Buffalo History Channel was. This everything that I explained to you is what led up to the creation of the Buffalo History Channel.